Okay. Catch that all five times. Okay, there we go. So that's the homework assignment title. You have to catch that ball five times. Okay, so I'm going to outline what you need to do. Okay. And we are going to start with the interface design or how you want to design the screen. Okay, so we'll go ahead and start with that. Okay, so before we go any further, I'm just going to give you, um, I'll, I'll do exactly what I usually do, you know, with when you start up with a new project. So the objective of this assignment, of this particular app, okay, why someone might want to download it, is really just to kill time. Okay, it's like, okay, I got a few minutes waiting for my bus. I don't want to be too absorbed into you know, some long game that I cannot just stop and move on. So I just want something, or I want to kind of improve my dexterity. I want to kind of increase my eye-hand coordination a little bit. Um, and that's what this game is for. Okay. And then the way that this game is going to be played is you, there will be a, a ball on the screen. It's not moving. But it only appears you know, up to like, you know, a certain amount of time. So in two seconds, it will, it will change its location. In another three seconds, it will change the location again. So you have to drag another object to hit the ball, okay, in order to stay in the game. Okay. And the, the amount of time, so with the first version of this homework assignment, we'll just make it easy, okay? So it's gonna be the same three seconds. After three seconds, you move the ball somewhere else. After three seconds, you move the ball somewhere else. And then you have to drag a second object to hit the ball. If you hit the ball, then it will instantly move to the separate lo a different location. And then you, you do it five times, and then the game is done. You, know, you have just completed like a basic you know, eye-hand coordination training. <laughs> okay. So, but you have to use sprites to do this. Okay. All right. So I'm pretty sure the recorder is on. Let me just double check. Recorder is on. The re so we'll go ahead and you know, start to describe what the homework assignment is going to do. Okay. So just to be complete, I'm going to include um, the objective or the value of this app. Okay. So the value of this app is to kill time and improve eye and coordination. There we go. All right. So this is why someone might want to install this app. It's small, it's easy, you know, just, you know, little game to play. The second thing we need to now specify is, okay, what is the design of the screen and how do we play this game, okay? So we will start with screen design. Or I can also describe the game itself, description. Okay, so use um, drag and object to collide with a ball. Do this five times and the game concludes. Okay? So we can we can certainly add you know, something that is competitive, like how quickly you can do it. Right? Okay? Because you know some people may take, I don't know, maybe seven seconds to do this. Other people are really quick, they may take like two seconds to do this. So there's a certain aspect of this game where you can still make it networked so that you can compete with a bunch of people having the same app installed. Okay? But we're not going to do that with the first version. Okay? So the first version is really simple. You just have to drag an item to collide with a ball in the canvas five times. Okay? The ball only stays in place for two seconds at a time, then it changes its location randomly. Okay? So this game does not conclude if you just don't do a single thing, it will just basically see the ball appear at one location for two seconds. After two seconds, it will appear at another location for two seconds. And then after they will appear, it will appear to another location for two seconds and so on if you don't do a single thing about it, okay? So it doesn't conclude by itself. If you drag the second object to collide with this ball and you hit it five times, then the game will, co will conclude. And I'm not even gonna keep track of time with this particular version, so we'll just make it really easy. And it's the, the whole idea is for you guys to, to basically just to get used to um, Canvas 
and the idea of sprites in the canvas. Yep? When you capture the ball and it moves to a new location automatically, right, at that point? Correct. Okay. And yep. Does the two seconds need to start from when it moves, or can it be part of a two second cycle? It's, uh, basically, it has to appear at that location for two seconds. Okay. okay. All right, so we want to look at the screen design, okay, because I want to specify the screen design so that you have an idea of what needs to be on the screen, okay? So the screen design will include a canvas, okay? And the canvas is the main user interaction area, okay? I want you to include a label, okay? The label to display um, how many more collisions before the game concludes. Is that okay? So basically it starts with five, and then once you drag your second object to hit the ball, it becomes four, three, two, one. By the time you get to zero, the game is concluded, okay? So only two main elements on the screen. Um, there's no start button, because it, the moment you start, the moment you open the app, uh, the application starts. Okay, so there's no start button. So now we specify the logic of the particular app here. Okay, so we'll specify the behavior, okay, to be more specific. Behavior of the app, there we go. <clears throat> okay, so the game starts as soon as the app starts. Okay, so there's no specific start button to start the game. Um, once a ball is hit, put a ball hit, uh, decrement the remaining number of collisions and immediately move the ball to a different position. Is that okay? The game concludes after five collisions or five hits. Okay. There is nothing. Okay. When the game concludes, use a notifier dialog box to inform the user the game has concluded. That's it. Are there any questions about the behavior of this game? Oh, maybe maybe I have to specify this one here. Okay. If a ball is not hit in two seconds, move the ball to a different position. Okay, so let me check. The game starts as soon as the app starts. Once the ball, once the ball is hit, decrement the remaining number of collisions and immediately move the ball to a different position. If a ball is not hit in two seconds, move the ball to a different position. So you have to kind of randomize that. The game concludes after five collisions. So I have to include one, two more things. Okay. okay the canvas includes two sprites. The first sprite is a ball, and its position is controlled by the blocks, the program itself. Okay. The second sprite is a is an image, and its position is controlled by the user dragging the sprite. Okay. So the collision is between the second sprite, which is user controlled, against the first sprite, which is controlled by the program. Is that okay? Right. There we go. All right. So are there any questions about what the what what is the behavior of this program? Questions? Is 
is all good. All right. So the next thing we'll do is we'll go ahead and finish the assignment, and then we'll go back and talk about the individual concept or elements that you need to use in order to get this done. Okay. So upload the usual thing, the AIA file of this app to this assignment, and you are done. There we go. I'll give you, I don't know, a week to do this. Trust me, that's a lot of time. Okay, and we'll make it due at the beginning of this class, 10.30. And it's a file submission. Five megabytes should be more than enough, unless you include a really, really complicated bitmap. Uh, submission setting, notifications, that's fine, grade. We'll make it a 50 point homework assignment. And it's a homework. Save and display. So now the homework is online, okay? All right. So this is your homework. Now the question is, how do we do this? So I'm, I'm not going to show you guys how to do it, but I will give you the individual you know, parts okay, that you need to know to get this done. All right, so we'll go to App Inventor. And then we'll talk about the, the canvas, sprites, and stuff like that individually. So you guys will have to make the connections. Question? Yep. Do you know where any good places to get sprites? Because you're, I don't know, you're limited to like Sonic. You can and take any the, image. Do you know of any good websites for sprites? For sprites? Yeah. Well, but a sprite is just an image. Exactly. Okay. You can draw your own too. Okay, so I will call this Sprite 1 because it's the first sample program related to sprites. Okay, well, maybe the first one won't even do sprites. Maybe the first one will only deal with a canvas. Okay, so we'll go ahead and specify a canvas, which is under drawing and animation. So under drawing and animation, you got three items here. The middle one is a canvas. So we'll just put a canvas here. And you can control the various parts of a canvas. So if you go back to the properties of a canvas, you can control the background image or the background color. If you do not specify an image as the background of the entire canvas, you, the background color will display. So you can specify any color that you want. The default is white, but it doesn't have to be. So you can look into here and go like, OK, there are these you know, different types of colors that you can choose as the background color. If you specify a background image, then the background image becomes you know, a part of the, um, of the canvas. So one way to increase the difficulty level of this particular game is to choose a background image that has a lot of circles. So it becomes very harder to spot the one that just appears, right? So that becomes you know, one way to play this game to make it kind of more difficult, especially if those circles are all the same size as the actual ball sprite. <laughs> yep. And can we have multiple images and change everything? Multiple images? Yes, you can. Because in your blocks, you can actually change your background image. <laughs> so you can just say every five seconds, you're going to change the background image. So suddenly, you know, all the background balls will go, you know, change their positions. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's easily one way to make the difficulty level increase. Yep. Okay. Um, <laughs> so the font size applies to only when you draw text in the canvas. So if you're not drawing any text in the canvas, then font size doesn't really do a single thing. Okay. Uh, same thing with um, paint color. It's the same thing. If you're not drawing anything, if you're not drawing any line or any circles, then paint color does not really matter because you know that's only useful when you're painting. The height applies to the entire height of the canvas. So you might want to change this so that you can accommodate both the canvas and the label. Okay? You can always just specify in pixels as well. So I, I can specify 200 pixels as the overall height of the canvas. I can specify 300 pixels as the overall width of the canvas. So 
So now I have a canvas that's kind of rectangular. Now, how you want to specify your canvas is up to you. Okay, so you can specify you know, the entire screen or close to the entire screen. Mind width is not going to be useful unless you are drawing something. So once again, in this particular homework assignment, mind width is not going to be useful. Are we doing okay so far with all this stuff? Yep. Okay. All right. So this is a canvas. Uh, it doesn't really do a single thing. It doesn't really do anything. So we want to go to blocks and say, okay, now we have a canvas, even without any sprites in it. What can we do with the canvas? Well, apparently there's a lot of stuff you can do already, but none of that is going to be what you need for this homework assignment. Because a canvas can detect drag motion inside the canvas, but that's not what you need. Because you're not dragging, you're not trying to detect just random drag motion, you're trying to detect a drag related to a particular sprite. So do not use the drag event handler of the canvas itself in your homework assignment. A canvas can also detect a flame motion, which is basically a linear motion. It's kind of like a drag, but it's fast and it's only in one particular direction. It can detect a you know, touchdown, so if you touch anywhere in the canvas, it will show up. You know, this event will, uh, will occur. And when you lift your finger, the touch up event will occur. And here's the touch event. Um, so this is after the down and before the up. And if you touch anything that is a sprite, it will also tell you whether a sprite is touched or not. But it doesn't tell you which sprite it has touched. So these are the event handlers that you can specify with a particular canvas. And once again, you do not need to use any one of these with this particular homework assignment. Now, if you want to um, make your game more challenging, you can use one of these things. It's like if you're clicking somewhere on the canvas, but you're not hitting, you're not dragging the ball, you're, you're missing the ball, you're missing the sprite that you're supposed to drag, you can get a penalty. Like, yeah, it would just it would just add one to the number of collisions that you need if you miss, right? And also you can play the in the background, you can play an audio you know, file of you know Homer Simpson doing right? <laughs> so you can make it more fun, okay? You know, so there are there are things, there are ways we can incorporate additional things in a canvas to make this game more fun, but we are not gonna do that. Okay. There are other things you can do with a canvas too. All right, so there, there's, you can clear a canvas. Now, when you when you clear a canvas, it means if you specify no background image, then the canvas will just go back to the background color that you specify. If you do specify a background image for the canvas, then it will just display the image itself. Whatever you draw or whatever you paint earlier on the canvas will disappear. The sprites will remain visible. Okay, if a sprite was visible before you clear the canvas, that sprite will not move because of clearing, and it will not change its visibility because you're clearing. So the clearing applies only to the canvas itself. It doesn't do anything to the sprites. Okay. And all the things that you can draw, okay, there are many, many things you can draw. You can draw a circle by specifying the center and the radius, and you can also specify whether you're filling the circle or not. You can draw straight lines, okay? Give it two points, x1, y1 is one point, x2, y2 is another point. It will draw a straight line between these two points. You can draw a single point, okay? When you draw a single point, you just have to specify a coordinate. You can also draw text, okay? In this case, x, y specifies the upper right corner of the text. Okay. Um, it doesn't tell you how much space is gonna be used by the text here which kind of makes it not very useful. Well, it is useful, but not as useful as it could be. This one draws text at an angle, so you can make your text angled if you want to, and specify this extra piece of angle here. You can specify, oh, tell me what is the current background color at coordinate x, y. The reason why this may be helpful is when you want to, let's say you want to make a game where you have to drive a little RC car through a maze, Okay. So you might want to see whether the RC car is currently uh, next to a wall, okay? And the wall is a back is a part of the background. So you want to check the color of a pixel to see whether your your RC car is next to a wall or not. Okay. 
So that can be useful if, you, if your background has specific color schemes. Um, you can get the current pixel color at a certain coordinate. The difference between these two is this one is always referring to the background color. In other words, if you paint a, a circle over that spot, this is not the first one, get background pixel color. It's not giving you the color of this circle. It is giving you the color of the background itself. If you have a background image, it will be returning the, that particular pixel of your background image. The second one, which is get pixel color, is basically whatever is on top. Okay, if you have if you just drew a circle on top of the background image, that will be the color of the circle. Is that okay? Does everybody understand the difference between these? Okay. You can save a canvas. Okay, when you save a canvas, it is saving it to a bitmap file. So you can make a little, you know, doodle, you know, tool, a little program for kids to draw pictures and then you will have a way to save the image onto the, uh, as a part of the app. So that can be useful, okay? So in your case, if you want to have kids to um, be able to take pictures, so you can use the picture as a background, and then you allow the kids to draw additional stuff on it, and then save the, the image after additional stuff is drawn. Yep? Is that saved to the background? Yes, and, 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 and the stuff, yes. Yeah, you can. <laughs> okay, and you can save as. So this one gives you a file name. Okay, so this one saves the image of the canvas to the external storage. If an error occurs, the screen's error occur event will be called. This one allows you to save to a particular file name, and the file name is must end with JPG, JPEG, or PNG, which determines the type of file. Yes, oh, then you can retrieve. Yes. Yep. You can use um, set background image in that case. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, we just passed it. So you can use this one to change your background image to one of the files that you have saved. So in this case, it, it specifies the name of a file containing the background image. Yep. So that's pretty handy. Now, on top of all of these things, you can actually change the background color as well. So in, in addition to being, being able to sample and tell what is the color of a particular pixel in the background, you can also change it on the fly. Okay. But remember, draw does not change the background color. Draw, you know, all the stuff that you draw are on top of the background. So until you save the file and then reuse that file as a background, you know, whatever you draw on the background does, is not a part of the background. Okay? So, yes, Canvas can do a lot of stuff. Unfortunately, in this particular app for this assignment, we're not going to use any one of these. <laughs> you can, if you want to, you can leave a trail, you know, of the motion of the, of the objects and balls and whatnot. I mean, you can do that, certainly. Okay, but we're not going to use any of those. So this particular project, as it, as it is right now, is not particularly helpful. Okay. So we go back to designer, and this time we drag a ball sprite to it. A ball sprite, as the name implies, is really just a little ball. Well, it can be a big ball, it can be a little ball. So the first thing we want to do is to look at the properties of a ball sprite. We are not going to talk about heading and interval just yet, so we'll look at the other ones. You can control the radius of your ball sprite. So five means literally five pixels as the radius. So it has a diameter of 10 pixels, which is very small, okay? So it doesn't take up much space on the screen. So one thing you can do <coughs> later on to make this game a lot more fun is to decrease the size of the ball. So you can start with something that's big so that it's easy to hit, <coughs> but as the, as the game progresses, then you can make both the, pixel, both the sprite that you drag smaller and also make the target ball smaller as well. So now you have to have your much more precise control of your drag motion, right? So that's one thing you can do to make the game a lot more challenging. But if you say, well, we want to make it easy at first, make it a bigger one. 
Okay? And you can change the size or the radius of the ball sprite on the fly using your blocks. So you can set radius. You can use set radius of the ball sprite and just change it in your own blocks. So every you know, minute, you can make it smaller and more, smaller and smaller until it disappears, right? <coughs> Okay, we're we not going to talk about speed just yet, okay? X, Y are the actual coordinate of the ball at this point. So you can drag it, even, on the, even in the design screen, you can drag it to see, oh, okay, this is 2, 2, and this is down here. It is um, 254, 149. So you can now see how it relates to the actual size of the screen itself. So the upper left corner of the ball is where the coordinate is specified. Okay? So if you look at my mouse pointer, this is the point where it is 254 in terms of x coordinate and 149 in terms of y coordinate. Is that okay? All right. All right, so now with, with a sprite in the canvas, we can now do some fun, fun stuff with it. Yep, go ahead. So when we randomly generate position, mm -hmm. we can go from 0, 0, it's the upper left corner. We have to minus the size of the ball. Correct. Okay. Yep. <coughs> in order for the entire, well, if you specify something that's outside, I think it will clip it and still display the ball. Oh. So it will automatically adjust to make sure the ball is still visible. But we can, we can test that, yeah, that's pretty easy. Yeah. Okay. Right. So what I'm gonna do next, because I don't wanna do your homework assignment, so I'm gonna use a text box to help specify where I want this you know, thing to be located. So we'll go ahead and specify a few things, like two text boxes and a button. So we'll pick out two text boxes, one, two, and a button to make it effective. Mm, let's not use a button because we have a canvas to begin with. Besides, we have a sprite to begin with. So we got enough stuff to specify when to update the position of the ball. And we want to make sure that both of these text boxes are numbers only. Okay, there we go. And we'll go ahead and rename one as text box X, which specifies the X coordinate. The other one is text box Y, which specifies the Y coordinate of the ball. And that's it, okay? So I want to specify two numbers here. If I, when I click on the sprite, it will change its position according to these numbers. Is that okay? Does everybody understand what I'm about to do? Okay. So we'll go ahead and specify the code to do this. All right, so given this is what I want to do, what object is going to be responsible for the event handler? I want to make it so that when I touch the sprite, it will update its own position based on what I have in the text boxes. So which object should I use as the owner of the event handler? The ball. The ball, yep, the ball sprite, okay. I could use the canvas too, because you know, in the canvas, if you look into the event handlers of a canvas, this touched. Yep. And it doesn't matter if there's a sprite on top of the canvas, it still will fire that. Yes, this will fire, but it will tell you whether it touched any sprites or not. Okay, so let's, let's, let's check out this one first, okay, because this is one way to do it. Not the best way, because this is actually more complicated. So the first thing when, when the canvas itself is touched is to ask the question, Okay, I know the canvas has been touched, but was a sprite touched as a result of that? So you want to use this as the condition of a conditional statement, because if it is not, if you're not touching any sprites, then there's nothing to do, okay? If a sprite is touched, okay, then it will tell you the position of the, of the, of the touch event but it doesn't tell you which sprite. It's okay in this case because we only got one sprite, okay? So it's okay, we know which sprite it is touching. So we'll go ahead and update the X and Y of that sprite to the text box values. Yes? Do the sprites themselves have touch events too, or just the canvas? The, the sprites themselves also have touch events, but I'm, I'm choosing to do this the long way. 
So now we go to Now we go to a sprite and we are ignoring all the event handlers because I have already chosen to use the other one, right? So we go to move to xy just like this. And this x is this parameter x here. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Otherwise it's not moving, is it? <laughs> uh, you know, I'm just going to This is a test program, so I'm not going <laughs> to I'm not going to do that. So I'm going to use x for x and then use y for y just like that okay that's all I'm gonna do with this program because I just want to see it move okay so we'll go ahead and build the APK and then on the other side I'm gonna start up my um, Android Studio bin studio sh start up my AVD Given that I'm actually running everything out of an external USB hard drive, this is actually pretty fast. Sorry? Yep. What works really well. Yep. All right. So the this is starting, and I'm going to go back to the text box. Uh, one of the boxes here and then we'll go ahead and start up uh, ADB so this is going to Android SDK platform tools ADB devices okay, not yet uh oh like that. Okay, now we're good. All right, so the browser should have everything done at this point. Yep, okay, so we'll go ahead and save sprite1.apk into the usual folder. So we now say adb install r downloads sprite1.apk. Have the app installed. And then we go to the emulator and check out Sprite One. Okay, Sprite One is right here. Okay, so we have the specified numbers. So I want to specify zero, zero first. Okay, zero and zero, and that should make the ball appear to the upper left corner. And then I can click somewhere in the screen, see how nothing is happening when I touch the rest of the screen. But if I touch the sprite itself, and it updates its location. Okay, very good. That's cool. And I also want to specify um, you know, something that's out of range. Okay, so I want to specify maybe 300 in this case, because I know the width of the canvas is not 300. So that's all I need to do to see, okay, what's going to happen if you specify an X coordinate that is outside of the ball? So once again, I'm clicking somewhere on the screen that is not the, the sprite itself. Nothing happens. And what if I click on these white pixels that are right next to the sprite? What do you think is going to happen? It shouldn't do it, right? But it did. So it's using the rectangle containing the ball as the boundary of the sprite, not the actual circle as the sprite. And this is actually rounded, okay? Because I know for sure that I did not specify 300 plus you know, the width of the ball as the width of the screen. I think I specified 300 exactly. So this really should push the ball you know, over, but it's not. It should be outside the right. Frame, right? Right. So if I change this number to something smaller, let's say we change it to 70, we should see a change of the position. And it's not. In other words, you know, it does bound checking automatically. It does not make a sprite appear beyond the confine of the canvas. Okay. Okay. So, any questions at this point about this particular app? 
Okay, pretty easy. Okay, all right. So this is the first one, and then the second one is going to be. Let me work on the second program. So this is the first one. Okay, I'm I'm done with this pro program here. We'll start a new project. We'll call it Sprite Two. Sprite Two. And in Sprite Two, I want to see what happens when things collide. So I'm gonna make it my my own collider. <laughs> Not, not the gigantic one in Europe, but we'll make a smaller version of that. Okay, so we'll go, we'll make uh, specify a sprite. I mean, a specify canvas. So specify a canvas, and this time we'll make it as large as possible. So I'll make the height field parent, and also make the width field parent. There we go, and we'll make this a particle collider. So I'll specify two particles here. And now, for those of you who want to do something fun, you can always look for uh, pictures of a molecule. So what molecule do you want to use for the collision? Caffeine. Caffeine, okay. Caffeine. Pretty sure I spelled it correctly. Yep. Caffeine, you know, come on. Where's my, where's my pronunciation? We look for images. Find one that is cool as a as a sprite. Okay, it's, most of these are pretty good. I like this one. What do you think? Good. good. And there's a pretty high resolution one. This one is 1483 by 1164. It's okay. We can we can deal with it. And we can always downsize it. Sorry. And it's an SVG, so you can make any size you want. Yep. So well, the SVG is the site, I think. So we'll go to the page. Yay. So we'll go ahead and save link as. Okay, it is as SVG. Okay, good. Uh, we'll save it to downloads. Fine. Okay. All right. So this is also a good way, good place to tell you guys how to convert an SVG into a form where you can put it into the app. An SVG cannot directly be used inside your app. Okay, you can upload the SVG, that's not a problem. But you cannot use it as a bitmap, as an as an icon or as a as a sprite. Okay? So you well we, we can try it and see if it works see if it works. What is SVG? SVG stands for scalable vector graphics. Uh, which okay. makes it infinitely scalable. Okay. okay. Now one app that I have here which is also available in Windows, you can download and install it, is actually really useful. It's called Inkscape. Inkscape is an app that can open PDFs, SVGs, PNGs, and a whole bunch of other stuff. But let's go ahead and use it to open up our SVG file. Okay, go here, and we specify the SVG file. Click open. Okay, then you go like, big deal. You know, the Photoshop can do this too. Okay, the first thing we want to know about an SVG is it's infinitely detailed okay because when you zoom in to just a tiny part like this see how sharp it is there's no pixelation whatsoever because the image is actually specified using commands like draw a line from here to here another line from here to here and so on so there's no pixel specification we are not specifying individual pixels of a line we're specifying the end points of a line and say how to draw a line okay so that's why you know SVG is really cool now with a tool like this, you can, okay, I'm zooming out again. So one thing you can do with a tool like this is to go to export PNG image. Then you can control, okay, how big do you want this image to be as a bitmap? <clears throat> the default resolution is, is you know, 1353 by 1068, which is the default. But you can always change that, okay? So you can basically just change this and say, no, we don't need you know, this, the image to be this big. So let's say we just want it to be, I don't know, 50 by 50, or 50 wide, and it automatically scales the, the height to 39, you know, 39 pixels tall. So that may or may, may not be enough to see all the letters, but let's just say that that's all we need. Yeah, you can change the DPI and that will affect the width. But in this case, I want to control the number of pixels. So I would let the DPI float, you know, be dependent on the number, the width, the number of pixels for the width. So now I just click you know, export as. 
and we specify a name for this. So we'll say uh, sprite one dot png. Okay, there we go. Click export. It's done. Okay, it's so fast, you know, we can't really see it. So now we switch back to the app here, and then we want to upload that particular file. It is still inside my downloads folder called caffeine. Where is it? There we go. Sprite one, sorry. Sprite one dot png, and this is the actual size of that thing. So it say open, click OK, and now we have the image uploaded. Now, just because the image is uploaded doesn't mean it is going to be used as the image of a sprite. So the next thing we need to do is to go to an image sprite, drag it into the canvas, and then this time we can specify its picture to be a sprite one. Click OK, and there we have our sprite. SVG are very small. Okay, so let's take a look at the actual size of that SVG like file. file like Say that one more time. Yeah. It's um, an SVG file. Does because it is resolution independent, so it has nothing to do with how big the image is. It has to do with how complex the image is. So if you have a very small image, but it has a lot of intricate, you know, details, you know, curls and lines and circles and stuff like that, it can still end up with a fairly large file. But you can specify a circle that's really big, but it can take up like maybe hundreds of bytes at the most. Because you're just saying, okay, the center of the circle is here, here's the radius, and this is the color. Draw the circle. So it can be very simple. In this particular case, it is not. It's probably medium size. I'm just going to show you the the actual the actual size of the caffeine one. So downloads caffeine.svg. So this one is 22 kilobytes, which is really really small. Yeah. But by comparison, sorry. How would you make one? How would you make one? Yeah. Inkscape. 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 The program that I that was using before, this one not only can it read and display SVGs, it can, you can also use it to make SVGs. It's one of the really really useful programs. It's open source. You can download and install in Windows or Mac OS X. Um, but it's also very useful. There are many many tools here that can be very useful. You can even um, give it a bitmap, and it will convert it into SVG which makes it very scalable. I have done it before. I took a picture of an oak uh, leaf because I want to use it as an icon and also as a logo. But being a logo, sometimes I need it to be really small to display on a web page. Other times I want to use it as a banner and I want it to be big, but I don't want the pixelation, okay? I can, I, I'm okay with the edges being a little bit jagged, but I don't want the pixelation. So one thing you know, Inkscape can do is to turn a bitmap into an SVG, so it's infinitely scalable without pixelation. So you know, it, it's a really good tool. Okay, I cannot you know, talk about you know, SVG, I mean, uh, Inkscape exclusively today, but for those of you who are interested, you know, go ahead and download it. There are tons of tutorials of how to use Inkscape on in YouTube as well. So if you go to YouTube and just type Inkscape, you, know, you can learn all the cool stuff you can do with it. Yeah. Yes, it's available for Windows, Mac OS X, and Linux. So all the major platforms are well supported. Um, it's also scriptable. For those of you who like scripting, you know, it's scriptable as well. If you want to automate and say, okay, I, want, I have something that I'd like to draw, it's really kind of complicated, write your own scripts. Because you can go to extensions and you can, um, you can write your own scripts, you can also use you know, one of these ex existing ones. You can do rendering, okay? You can do all kinds of kind of funky you know, rendering. So if you went and do the same kind of manipulation on different images, yep. write a script. Yes, but you can also do something a lot more complicated. When you look at the extensions and they're all scripts, if you go to render, okay, where is it? Yeah. Render is right here. It can even do barcode. And within barcode, you can do QR code. 
So you can say, I want to generate the QR code to do something specifically, okay, a web, a URL for instance, um, and you just click apply using the default. Maybe it has to do with this. So let me let's go 15. Oh, I'm missing one particular component. But if I had that component, it would be able to generate the QR code. If you give it the URL and the other parameters of your QR code, it would generate the, P the QR code for you. Um, the, the thing about QR code is it, it's, also, it's very error resistant. So there's a lot of redundancy built into QR code. You will be surprised, okay? You know, with some QR code, depending on how it is configured, you can use your finger and cover half of the QR code, and it will still be scannable. That's how my sloppy pictures always seem to get the yes. download. Oh, if you think about it, when you're shipping something, you know, because the, sh the the carriers they all use you know like barcode scanners, you know, or QR code scanner to scan the destination, where it's coming from, which package is this, so it's tracked automatically. So if you think about that, a lot of the abrasion, like you know, when you're rubbing boxes against boxes and stuff like that, sometimes the QR code or the, the barcode will be like scratched off and stuff like that. There will be damages to the barcode. It's still scannable for the most part. So it's, it's amazing you know, how uh, resilient those uh, QR code can be. And it's one of the parameters. You can actually make it more resilient or less resilient, depending on you know, how, how much space you have to make the QR code. All right, so that's, that's the first uh, thing, the first uh, sprite. What do you want to as the second sprite to do the collision? <laughs> you want the caffeine to, to collide with what? Into a cup. Into a cup, okay, very good. So let's do a cup. All right, so let's go here, look for a coffee mug. Coffee mug. Uh, coffee makes me poop. Okay. Drink coffee. Now remember, you know, the, the icon is going to be small, so we don't want it to be too big. So let's make it... But first, coffee. But it's going to be small, so you won't be actually be able to read the text on it. Uh, so many choices, I can't make up my mind. Which one? This one or this one? Yeah. This one? Great. Okay, fine. So we'll go visit the image. Or well, could have just clicked save too. So we'll go ahead and save image as, and we'll just call it mug. Okay. So right now this is a, a JPEG, which means the white background is actually right. Which also means if you render this against a red background in the canvas. The white background of this thing is going to show up, which is not cool, okay? And then the other thing is, it's not even using the entire image for the cup itself. You know, that's not cool either, because it means you know, this cup cannot go all the way to the edges. Because the background goes all the way to the edges, but what is actually a part of the cup cannot go all the way to the edges. So we're going to do some image processing here, simple stuff. So we go to graphics, and we use the GIMP, okay, G-I-M-P, which stands for the GNU Image Manipulation Program. Yes, probably a programmer came up with that name. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we go to downloads again, so we go to downloads. And we have mug.jpg. Now, okay. why are you using this instead of the other one? Because this program is good for cropping and doing actual raster image manipulation. The other one is good for vector graphics. This one is good for raster. Okay. Okay. So we'll work with this one. So the first thing I want to do is to um, kind of downsize the picture a little bit. Okay, so we will only include the part that is a part of the cup. And I can do some fine tuning. Okay. Oh, maybe right there. 
So I can, some I can do some fine tuning to make sure that it is at the right edges. And for those of you who cannot really see it, I can magnify. Okay, where's the magnification? Yeah, I thought it's control plus. But it won't do it here. So let's do this part. Zoom is 100. Zoom in. It's just plus. Oh, okay. It's not control plus. It's just plus. Okay, there we go. So now we can kind of nudge the edges so that we are only including a part of the image. There we go. And it's GIMP only on the Sorry? It's GIMP only on the no, the GIMP is also available to Mac OS X, Windows, okay. a whole bunch of uh, platforms. You can look at it as Photoshop Light Light. Okay, it's a very, very lightweight you know, program. It can do a lot of common stuff that you want to do with photographs and whatnot, but it's not Photoshop. So you cannot use it to replace Photoshop, especially in a production environment. But as a amateur or as an end user, it can do probably 90, 95% of what you normally do with Photoshop. It can even read Photoshop files. So that's the other cool part. Okay, so we'll do the cropping first. So we'll go here and say we want to crop to selection. Can I crop because, oh, okay. Okay, let's do it one more time. There we go. There we go. Okay, when the lines are, um, I don't know whether you can see whether it's, you know, like the, these things are actually moving. So now it is selected. We can now say crop to selection. Excellent. And then the other thing we also want to do is to get rid of the white background, so to turn it transparent. Right now they're not transparent. So we can do that, to, we can make it transparent. To do that, we have to go to layer. We have to add a transparency layer. Go to transparency, and then you say add alpha channel which is useful for expressing transparency. Then we have to go select all the white pixels and say, okay, all of these, remove it, okay? Delete these pixels. So you can go to this tool here, which is selected by color. It gives you a, a sampling tool, and you just click on one pixel that is of the color that you want to get rid of, and it will highlight everything of that color. So right now, it's hard for you, harder for you guys to see because you know, the lines are kind of thin but it is actually selecting the white part of the entire picture. And then with one single deletion of all that stuff, you go to edit and you just say delete or cut or clear, all that stuff becomes transparent now. So now you have a, a bitmap that has the background being transparent and only the coffee mug itself being visible, which is much more appropriate when you want to turn this into a sprite. Because otherwise it would display the, uh, the entire rectangle. Now it, only, it will only display the mug. How do you make the color transparent? It doesn't make the color transparent. It removes that color. OK, so it doesn't actually have a box. It, it's, be, it's because the representation of a color is RGBA, RGB alpha. So when the, so the alpha is, is controlling the visible or the transparency of that particular pixel. So I basically just turned it uh, turned all those pixels to transparent by max either maximizing or minimizing alpha. I cannot remember which end is which end. Okay. So with all this done, we can now go click file and um, export. I cannot. I don't want to overwrite because a JPEG cannot represent a transparency transparent background. So do not save it as a, as a JPEG. You definitely want to export as a JP, uh, um, PNG file. Because PNG can represent transparency. So you do export. It will ask you a few questions. Do you want to save background color? Yes. That's important. Save gamma? Yes. Mm. And then click export. OK, so now we have a second image. We go back to our App Inventor. And we do another upload. This time it's our coffee mug as a PNG. And we make a second sprite, second image sprite. And make the second image sprite make use of the coffee mug. There you go. And it's a little bit too big. That's okay. We can 
You can always change the, the scale of the whole thing. So you can basically just change the, uh, the height so it's no longer automatic. And you can control the actual pixels of the image. Um, you might want to preserve the ratio a little bit. It, it's not required. Okay, so we, so I'm guessing it is about six to five, kind of the ratio. So we'll specify sixty. Oh, it does automatically rescale the whole thing. Okay, so we want to change the width. Oh, I specified the height. Okay, that's the wrong one. I want to. I want this one to be fifty. The other one to be sixty. There we go. There we go. So now we have a we have the uh, a coffee mug as a sprite, and then we have the caffeine particle as another sprite, and we want these two to collide. Originally, when I first you know, wrote this you know, program as I was writing it, I wanted it to go in a circular motion, just like in a real you know, particle collide collision machine. Then I thought about it and go like, eh, that's a little bit too much work. <laughs> Because you have to kind of rotate the image to kind of make it look nice, so the cup actually tries to, you know, catch the caffeine particle. So instead of doing that, I'm just going to do linear motion. Okay. So we'll do linear motion, but we'll make it so that you know it is kind of like air particles in a container. So when you hit the boundary, it will bound, keep bouncing around, and those two will basically keep bouncing around independently until they collide. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and write this code. There we go. All right. Is it possible to make it so that they would bounce off of each other instead? You can make them bounce off each other as well, yes. So we'll go ahead and just make them bounce around a little bit. Now, if I don't want to change the speed and stuff like that, I can actually pre-program all that stuff here. I can control the heading of the sprite. Zero degree means it is heading east, okay? It's not north, it is east, okay? So zero degrees is east. Let me see. Is that the case? I think it is. Okay. Um, interval means you know how often should the position be updated. Okay. So in this case, it's being updated ten times per second because one hundred milliseconds is one tenth of a second, which means it is getting updated ten times per second. And the speed is what's tell is telling you. Okay, each time it updates, how many pixels should it move? Okay, so a speed of zero means it's not moving at all. Okay, so you might want to change this one to something else. So you want to change this, let's say, to 20 pixels. Okay, so every second it's going to travel 200 pixels because it's getting 10 updates and each update is 20 pixels. We also want to change heading just a little bit because. Uh, a heading of zero is just horizontal, which is not very interesting. So we want to turn this into maybe 45 degrees, just so it's at an angle. All right, so that's okay. All right, so we got everything here. And we're going to do the same thing with the caffeine particle here. We definitely want to specify a non-zero speed. So let's specify 30, so the particle is going a little bit faster than the other one. And we wanted to have a heading that is well, let's see, 40 is here, we'll do, do a 135, so just so that they, they head out in different directions to begin with, because we don't want a very early collision, it wouldn't be a whole lot of fun to watch. Okay, there we go. All right, so now we got all of this stuff here. The app itself would actually work, you can actually see it moving, so let's go ahead and do it first. Okay, let's go ahead and make the APK, install it so that we can actually see the particles and the cup, the particle and the cup moving. But what if they get to the edge? What's going to happen? It will keep sliding until it gets to the corner, then it cannot slide anymore, then it will just stop. Okay. So I want, to, I want to show the behavior first before we fix that and go like, okay, that's not bouncing around, which is no, which is, this is no fun. Okay. So we have sprite 2. Get back to the command line. Not that one. This one. And this is sprite two. Go back to the emulator. There we go. Here's sprite two. There we go. That's all it does. Okay. Not a whole lot of fun. They're not colliding. 
they are not even doing anything right now. Well, they are actually technically doing something. Each one is trying to go in the direction it was told to, do, told to, to go. But since it's bound by the canvas itself and they cannot escape it, that's why they got quote unquote locked into the corners right now. Okay. All right. That's not a whole lot of fun. So we're going to change this. Okay. The way we change this is to say, hey, if you collide with something, I want you to do something. Or if you reach an edge, I want you to do something. So with image sprite 1 and also with image sprite 2, we're going to do the same thing. Okay? We say that if you reach an edge, which can be any one of the edges of the canvas, and this one tells you which edge is you're, you're encountering, but we, are not gonna, we, we don't have to know what it is because there's a really nice uh, block in a sprite that makes use of an edge. Okay. So let's go back to a sprite and see what we can do with the sprite. We're already in an event handler, so there's no need to look at the other event handlers. So we'll go like, hey, what about this first block here called bounce? Looks like it makes use of an edge, which is given to you. So you hover over this, and it says, makes this sprite bounce as if off a wall. For normal bouncing, the edge argument should be the one returned by edge reached. Well, hold on a second here. Aren't we already in? edge reached event handler. So let's pick out this block. Looks like this is going to be fun. Let me just take this edge, put it here, okay? And then we'll do something like exactly the same over here, except for sprite 2. So we're, all we're doing is to tell sprite 1, hey, if you hit the edge, go ahead and bounce as if it is bouncing off a wall. So that means if this is the edge and your sprite is heading in this direction, then it will bounce off like that. It will automatically understand this is the incoming angle and this should be the outgoing angle. It will do it all by itself. There's no need for you to do, cal to do the, any calculations. If it gets to a corner, so let's say the sprite is heading this way, it will just bounce back up. Okay. So this is all done automatically, it's all done for you. And this is all you need to do to make it bounce around. It doesn't do the collision collision uh, detection just yet, but it will bounce around, which is kind of fun to watch. So let's go ahead and build this particular app. Save APK to my computer. Now the sprites can only automatically go in a straight line. If you want to make a trajectory, like a parabola or something like that, it cannot do that. Okay, so you will you will have to manually update the position of the sprite if you want it to. If you want to like a gravity simulation thing, you will have to do all the calculations and move the sprites yourself. So save file, yes, overwrite, and then we'll re-upload. and run the program again and this is a lot more fun because you can see the cup is actually moving and the caffeine particle is moving now that should have been the collision okay because if they just collided <laughs> oh, there we go again are there any questions about this nope okay so let's go for the third part of this particular thing and basically say when they collide what should we do about this okay hmm well you can change um, the image of a sprite when they collide you can actually change the image you can do whatever you want okay so the first thing is okay how do we know that they, they have collided well let's look at the event handlers okay the first one is collided with and when you read the description of this it says Handler for colliding with event events. When called when two sprites, specifically two sprites collide, note that checking for collision with a rotated image sprite perfectly checks against the sprite's unrotated position. Other, therefore, collision checking will be inaccurate for tall, narrow, or short wide sprites that are rotated. Well, we don't have those, okay? We have two that are relatively square ratio sprites, so we'll be okay, okay? It's not going to be way off when it comes to our sprites. Okay, great. So we click Collided With. 
and it's gonna collide with well since we only have one other sprite this other has got to be in image uh, sprite 2 because we, we are talking we are looking from the perspective of sprite 1 so when it says okay I collided with other that other has to be sprite 2 okay but if let's say you have 20 gazillion sprites because you're writing a game and everything is a sprite okay so how do you know which sprite you have just collided with other Okay, other is a sprite. So you can actually know which other sprite you have collided with and potentially change the property of the other sprite in addition to your own sprite. Okay, so there's a possibility if you want to do that. All right, so let's just say that for the sake of this particular you know, sample program, all I want to do is to show the face of someone who is awakened by caffeine. Okay. So let's see, um, caffeinated expression, okay, let's check images, there you. that's actually, that's anxiety, <laughs> it's anxiety induced by caffeine, <laughs> oh I know which one I want, caffeinated cat, that's all, that's it, <laughs> this one, <laughs> so we'll, we'll change the image of the cup into the caffeinated cat during the collision, okay? But when it's out of the collision, we'll change it back to a cup. Is that okay? Sure. All right, let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> so we will save the image directly. Oh, that's not saving the image. That's actually saving something else. Okay, fine. We'll do a save image as. Okay. We'll just call it cat. And then go to the. Do exactly the same trick. Okay, so we open the cat.jpg file. And then we want to. Now, with this one, you have to be a little bit more careful because there are some white pixels, you know, as the catch light and also stuff like that. So that's also going to be. <laughs> That's also going to be gone. Okay, it will become the background color. So let's say I'm not too picky today, so I'm just going to pick out all the white pixels. And there are some pixels here and here that are also picked out. It's okay. I'm not too. I'm not picky today. Use the magic wand. Use the magic wand. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know about that. Okay. So let's give it a try. The magic wand. Okay, so let's, well first of all we have to add a new transparency layer, so go here, add an alpha channel, and then we can now delete. You can tweak the to make it Is it good right now? Looks good. I think it's reasonable. Okay, we can change the threshold. I don't think it's doing a whole lot. You have to select it again. After you it. Oh, okay, I see. That's too much. Yeah, that's too much. 100% I see. There we go. Well, that's just a face. There we go. <laughs> You can you can you can play with Gim all day long. Okay, so let's say that is the case. Yeah, it's it's trying to be smart and find out. You know, it allows variation of color change along the border. So it's not really selecting by the color. It's actually trying to find the boundary of whatever you're trying to you know, crop out in this case. It's really nice for, like, when you get the pressure on the edges, like on a JPEG. Yep. You can also feather the edges, too, which is kind of nice, too, but I'm not going to do the uh, feathering. So let's just over, uh, export. Remember, do not uh, save as JPG anymore. You need PNG in this case. So we click export, export, there we go. 
So now we have the caffeinated cat. And we go back to the app. App, app, right here. Okay, there are several things we can do. We can um, we can show the cat as the background <laughs> while the caffeine particle is colliding with the cup. And when they are no longer colliding, we'll display the usual stuff as the background. Okay. All right. So let's see how we can do that. Okay. So we go to blocks, and then we say, okay, when sprite one is colliding with has to be sprite 2 because there are only two sprites here. So we're going to do something. Oh, first of all, we have to upload the image. Okay, so we'll go ahead and upload. Find cat.png. Upload it. So it becomes a resource here. Okay. And then we can go back to the blocks <clears throat> and change the canvas background, set background image. to that file. And it's really just the file name itself, so we just have to specify the file name, which is cat.png. Now this is Linux, so that means it is going to be case sensitive. If you save with uppercase C, you have to use uppercase C. Okay, But I don't want to show the, cats, the, the, the cat all the time. When the collision is no longer there, I don't want to show the cat anymore. I, or I might want to show a cat that is de decaffeinated. <laughs> okay, yeah. I don't. I think a de decaffeinated cat won't even meow. It's just going like. <laughs> okay, but we can just get rid of that. Now to do that, you have to go to the image, and you can see that there's another event when it is no longer colliding, which is really handy for what we are doing here. So now you can use this and say, hey, you know, we'll go ahead and use this um, let's see and set the image to nothing so we go to this block here duplicate and change the file name to nothing I think that will reset the background image to nothing sorry remove the what so just take the pink block out take the Oh, with yeah. no argument like that? I like the field yeah. That may not be the best way to do it. <laughs> so we'll just give it an empty file name. We'll see whether it works or not. Okay. Now, the colliding thing you know, may or may not work with your homework assignment. So you will have to check it out. Because the colliding may only trigger when the sprites are moving on their own. So it may or may not work when you, if, it, it depends on how you do it. Okay. There are several ways to do it, and it depends on how you do it. If you do it in a certain way, the collide, colliding with will work. If you do it in another way, it may not work. Okay, I'm not going to tell you what which one is which one, so you guys can kind of experiment with it a little bit. If colliding with does not work, how can you tell that the sprite is on top of the other one? You can use the x, y, and then you can use the width of each sprite to and do set, the calculation. Set down to which one, which, one is, which one appears to be on top of which one. Yep. But that's only appearance. All yeah. right. Overlapping. Yeah. OK, so let's try out this one. And there is a very easy way to modify the first test program to see if if you just put a sprite on top of the other one, would it generate the collided with event? Okay, you just need a second sprite, two more text boxes, or you know, another event handler. So you can move two sprites onto one spot, and then you can <coughs> see if the uh, collision event happens or not. I'll, I'll show you guys what to do with that one. Okay, save, replace. Emulator. There we go. Sprite two. All right. Sprite 
right. Collide, collide, yay! <laughs> I can watch this all day long. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I think that's that's really a lot of fun. I I once heard a joke about you know how um, how fascinated you know cats are because they can follow a laser pointer or do something that seemingly is is totally like. Just t killing time from our perspective, and then the second part of the joke is, it is also amazing how people watch their cats doing that. <laughs> <laughs> I have two cats, so I get to tw spend twice the amount of a normal person to doing that. Did you yeah. Them coffee? <laughs> no, my my cats actually, I I I let them drink coffee if they want to. You know, it's I go, I present my coffee black or otherwise, and the cats have no interest whatsoever in the coffee. One, the, uh, one of the cats like tortilla chips. So whenever I sneak around to the, to the uh, pantry and open the uh, tortilla chips, you know, Riley would hear that, the crunching sound, and he would just run to me and go like, ah, ah, come on, give me some chips. And, it would, it would, and he would eat the chips too. The other cat does not care about chips. Riley will eat anything that is salty and crunchy. You know, potato chips, tortilla chips, salted and roasted peanuts, anything that's salty and, and, and crunchy, he'll go after. Yep. So is our task to actually physically move the cup ourselves to catch the caffeine? You have to make the cup follow your finger. In a drag. So we're going to be dragging the cup. It's You're going to be dragging. Stuff. Yep. Mm hmm. Doesn't have to be how yeah. can we be creative? Oh, you can be creative. One has to be a ball, the other one is up to you to decide. Okay, so let go, let's get back to Sprite One because you know if you want to test whether the collision thing is going to generate when you have two sprites on top of each other, this is how you can do it. Okay, you just put a second sprite into this design here. Okay, we can use another ball sprite if you want to. And then when you go to the blocks, you, you specify the same thing with the second sprite. You just duplicate this block here and apply that to, oh, that won't work, would it? Um, oh, okay, that's easier. Okay, even easier, we throw it away like that, and then move ball two to the same position, right? Then we want to detect whether there's a collision or not. So now we want to go to the collision thing, go to ball one, collide it with, and then we specify something that is visible. Okay, so we just go to the canvas, and we say, we can draw text, yay. Okay, so we can just draw, um, it doesn't give me the XY. Well, I guess I can get the XY from ball itself. Okay, that's fine. So we'll specify some text here. We just say collision. Oops, spell typo. Collision. There we go. And then we use the x of ball one and then the x of ball two. Okay. The ball one and just ball one. X y of ball one. So we go to the x coordinate. Duplicate y. Oops. Ah. Okay, there we go. Here's Y. And that should be it, right? Okay, so let's check out this one. Uh oh. I get it sometimes, but you know, it self corrects. Almost out of time. Okay, so hopefully we get just enough time before Bob opens the door. <laughs> okay, so we have to do this as quickly as possible. Okay, go back to the emulator. Back. Sprite one. Okay, give it something. 200. 200. Click one. 
Yep, there's a collision. So it works, okay? So that makes your homework assignment a whole lot easier to do. <laughs> I'm not gonna disclose much more than that. <laughs> but we have the lab time, so go to the lab to do your homework assignment. If you encounter any questions, you know, I will be there to answer your questions. Probably with more questions.